And there's one other person that I need to recognize, and that's my wife, Carol, who's right here in front. This is a picture of Carol and my dog, Puma, and Carol like, has been willing to like, let me go off and do all kinds of crazy things, and we go shopping. She lets me shop for things, as you know, physics teachers and how we shop for things. Okay. She lets me get away with that kind of stuff, and she's been a tremendous good sport. Like, for instance, I said, I need a photograph that demonstrates the difference between different mammals have different kinds of eyes. Puma. <laughs> Okay, well, so you get like red eye, and then you get blue eye, and it's not only a different color, there's a tremendous difference in the intensity, and so if I bring down the intensity on the photograph, you can see there's a big difference there. And so I said, okay, Carol, you have to take Puma, you have to hold his eyes, and I'm going to like shoot a series of flash photographs of you until I get one that shows what I need to show. And Carol puts up with this stuff, and I'm going to say, thank you, Carol, for that. It's great. The, the whole process of, of becoming the teacher um, that I am, it was, it was a long and hard road. And hard lessons. I think when I started teaching, I did mostly lecturing. You know, I taught as I was taught. I did mostly lecturing. My first significant teaching assignment, I taught at Kenny College. Then I went over to Africa. I taught in Africa for a couple of years. I had an interesting experience there. In my last year, I got this intestinal parasite. I probably shouldn't be telling this story. Um, anyway, I got this intestinal parasite, and it required me to have to excuse myself from the class with a very short warning. I'd be like talking, it's like, I need to excuse myself for a couple of minutes, I'll be back. And it turns out, it made me a way better teacher. <laughs> it's crazy, because I, had, I, I couldn't lecture all the time. I had to have activities that the students could do. I had to be ready to give them something which would take them five minutes to do at a moment's notice. And so I had to break my class up into mixtures of lectures and activities. And my teaching spiked, it got way better. And I thought, you know, if I get diarrhea and leave the class, my students are doing better. That should have told me something. But I just didn't have the whole slow learner factor going here. Um, didn't necessarily work. When I came to Colorado State University, I was one with all the toys, and so I got asked to do school programs. And the early ones didn't go so well, didn't go so well. And so the birth of the little shop of physics actually, it began in a failure. They began it in a sad failure in an eighth grade classroom. I went in and did a program that was essentially a college lecture delivered to a group of 13 year olds. And it, was, it was really rough. <laughs> The little shop of physics actually had its birth in a very bad experience in an eighth grade classroom. It was bad. They were falling asleep, they were passing notes, and it was really kind of a humiliating, awful experience. But they liked being able to come up afterwards and work with all the stuff that I had. And then I made it my quest to go back to the school and present some sort of experience that was interactive where the kids got a chance to do things. They got to touch it. They got to do. That's what they wanted, that's what they needed. That was the birth of the little shop of physics. physics is that science is accessible. I mean, we have our, our, the stuff we do is exciting, it's fun, it's engaging, and we hope that people come up with that message. It's also effective. We have some great data that shows that the lessons that we present, the experiments that we present, the experiences we share with kids, teach them things, and we can show that. But the main take on message is this, that science is something anybody can do. It's hands-on. Kids are working with things. They're touching things. They're making stuff happen. And everything we do is safe, Something anybody can duplicate at home. All of our projects look home built. They look like they're built by taking parts that you buy at a garage sale and slapping them together and painting it colorfully. And that's because that's how they are built. And, and they originally did that because they didn't have any money. But later it turned into a theme of what we do. Everything we build, kids can look at that and say, I could do that. And sometimes kids will say that to us. They say, I could build that. And we say, we know. We want you to build this. We want you to go home and make fun. Go ahead and do it. You can. And that accessibility is really, really crucial. And I think that's an important lesson about the scientific enterprise that gets lost sometimes. The little shop of physics means different things for anyone who sees it, I think. If you have a four-year-old kid, they don't know if they're going to be a doctor or a physicist or a lawyer or a writer and figure out what. They, they probably don't even have a, a clue of what they want to do. But it's a way to expose them to the wonders of the world and if nothing else, hopefully just inspire them to think about things a little differently, if not actually inspire them to pursue science more formally in school or for a career. Ask them, you know, what they're discovering or showing them a way to find something cool about the project. 
that's helping to show kids that science is something that's really, really cool, really entertaining, and something that they can do at home. It's really, really fun to just see kids light up when they're working with a project and they suddenly discover how everything works. So I think it's a very important aspect of things. It gives a hands-on science, which is really rare sometimes, and it makes science fun, which a lot of kids, and I know undergrads like me, kind of have a negative view on science, and little shop takes that away. I mean, it's great to watch you know, a kid go nuts over something you built and then just playing with it way too hard and then it's very good. It's a, so it's part of the process. They were so excited about something that I built that they broke it. So kids have so different concepts and so they'll just have a great time working with a, an experiment that they are learning as they go. And then with other kids that have more experience with it, they can start making connections and transferring their learning. There's an automatic space like this. It's a high entropy environment. And in this world, those things are sort of squash. And this is a place where people, not just from this background, but from any background, whether it's physics, or engineering, or biological sciences, or English, or art, um, can come and sort of express themselves and and really do some good in the world. I think that's an opportunity that everyone is there to have a life. When I think back uh, 20 years of low couch physics, what my happiest memories are, all of them are times when I've been out on the road, I'm sharing something with a kid, and it makes an impact. The kid understands something they didn't see before, or sees something in himself they didn't see before. And, and, and watching that happen, even in a short time, you can have experiences with kids that they take with them. And, and watching that happen is magical. So that's a little bit about how Little Shop started, and also kind of a taste as to how it, how it, how it exists. We have these school programs, and the core of what we do is we travel to a school and we set up all the stuff. And it's, it's hands-on. The kids get to explore and experiment and engage with the projects that we have. And the undergraduate students facilitate. And that piece, right there, that's the core of what we have going on. We, we've started doing a bunch of workshops with teachers um, where we show the techniques that we have and say these are ways that we've developed to share science with kids. And then there was another interesting failure that led to the development of this television show, which is called Everyday Science, and that's shown locally. And that's been fun. We have some kids in the studio, and we're doing some experiments on the topic. And this was... I think this was the Cycles show. That's our most recent effort, which is really great. And then recently we started doing some more podcasts. And this is uh, Nissa and, and Doug and, and guests put it on, doing the Science It Up podcast. And um, we have a whole bunch of different things that you can access from our webpage if you want to look at some of our video things. And that's been a really great tool. And it also means that we have like a videographer on staff so we can make like you know, little biographies with stirring music underneath, which everybody <laughs> needs. I think it's a good, good thing. And we mostly do things close to home, but occasionally we travel farther afield. Um, we do some international work. Um, Chris and I have had a chance to do things in Slovenia and Mexico. We had a whole bunch of Korean high school teachers who visited us for a number of years, and we've had um, sabbatical visitors from Korea, and, and that's been really, really fantastic. And then we do this extended road trips. Mostly we visit Native American reservation areas. So at Thanksgiving break, spring break, Christmas break, we go on the road for two days to five days and visit some schools in kind of like distant areas. And that's been really, really great because the rural areas and the reservation areas, um, we learn as much as we teach. And there have been um, very, very uh, wonderful connections which we've been able to make. In addition, we do this annual open house where we throw, set up everything we have and we open our doors. We're doing a small scale version of that later today. We're going to take a whole van load of stuff and set it up upstairs. And we just open our doors and, and let people play. One room is a light room. And one room is a dark room. And then we have another ballroom that's for our presentations. And so the interviews are part of that as well. And they'll make a 15 minute presentation that might have to do with sound or electricity or motion or um, ice cream. That's a big favorite. I like chocolate. People just sit and have a great time watching them and getting excited about it. 
believe about 7,000 people came this year, which was really fantastic. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a real popular thing locally. Well, doing all this, doing all this, it has taught me a lot of lessons, and particularly the interactions with the kids. Um, all you need to know about science teaching, I learned in kindergarten, through my interactions in kindergarten classrooms. I, I've learned a lot that's enabled me to become uh, a much better teacher. And I want to share some lessons. And I want to, I want to put these in like the pithy Robert Fulgham style um, series of aphorisms. And here's my first one. The world is comprehensible and you learn about it by exploring. And really, isn't this what science is about? I mean, we're, we want to teach kids that you can learn about the world, you can understand it, and the way to do it is by trying stuff. And where did I learn this lesson? It was not a formal education experience. It was not a formal education experience. Who taught me Newton's laws? Not by telling me, but by letting me explore? Yes, it was my mother, actually, <laughs> who's here today. For instance, remember once I pulled something like halfway out of an electric outlet, took a knife and stuck it across the prongs to see what would happen. If you do that, it blows the fuse and welds things together. And uh, she let me get away with it. She just said, well, you know, that probably wasn't a really good idea. Uh, but you learned something, and so we just won't learn that particular lesson again. Um, she's really, really level-headed and really, really wonderful, and I want to thank her for helping me uh, become an educator at Amstake. My mom was a teacher, my older brother's a math teacher, my younger brother's a chemistry teacher. Oh yeah, the apples did not fall too far from the tree. It's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing.